Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming uh, to the early morning talk. Um, my name is Mark Chalabois. Uh, I'm a director of engineering and corporate R&D at Qualcomm. Uh, this is Rashmi Chitrakar uh, from Qualcomm. She's a senior staff engineer working for the Qualcomm uh, Open Source Technology Group. So we wanted to talk about some work that's been going on uh, between the two groups for SPDX generation uh, via Yocto and a new open source license scanner called LID. So just so everybody's familiar with the terms, I don't know if everybody's familiar with all the things that uh, I'm going to talk about, so I just thought I would go through uh, some of the different projects that are related to uh, what motivated this, then talk about some of the current limitations in Yocto scanning, uh, a new source map layer that I created to uh, address some of the limitations that I found, and then some issues around reducing scan times overall. And then uh, Rashmi will talk about LID and license scanning in general, Fossology, some of the work that was done to compare Fossology with, uh, with LID. And then um, we can talk about sort of the directions that we want to go, take any questions, and uh, hopefully figure out a good way forward. So some of the terms, there's uh, SPDX, which is, uh, if people aren't familiar with the standard format for documenting license information uh, for files and packages. Fossology has been a, uh, a tool that's been used to do this license scanning. It was originally from HP. Uh, it's now a project at Linux Foundation. And then uh, Open Embedded is a way to, it's a, not a binary distribution like a Ubuntu or Debian or SUSE. It's a source-based uh, distribution where you have recipes and you build the entire distribution. Uh, and so it uses a tool called BitBake, uh, and that was derived from the Gen2 Portage system for building from source. And then there's the Yocto project, uh, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, which is, uh, again, layered on top of Open Embedded um, and is a Linux Foundation collaborative project that uh, in addition to using Open Embedded, provides uh, SPDX support um, using a plugin called Do SPDX, uh, which currently is uh, based on or uses Fossology. And then I uh, am currently the Technical Steering Committee Chair of Drone Code, which is another Linux Foundation uh, collaborative project. And what motivated me to start all this was uh, Linux, Drone Code wants to release images of uh, pre built. Um, uh, flash images that you can put on a drone and release them right from the website of the project. And in order to do that, we want to do license scanning so we can uh, make sure it's compliant and make sure that uh, we're not violating any licenses. So this is a small organization. It doesn't have a big budget. What we're looking at something is tools that allow an organization like that to be able to do a license scan and then um, have confidence in releasing the, uh, the binaries. So the existing S uh, do SPDX uh, class or the SPDX BB class that's in Yocto today is fairly simple. It inserts this do SPDX stage uh, during the build. So when you bit bake a package, it goes through a fetch, unpack, patch, configure, compile, and so forth stage. So the do SPDX will insert after the patch stage, look at the source directory, and then uh, hook up with Fossology to do a scan of all the files that it finds there. Um, but it doesn't really capture any package dependencies. It will generate an SPDX report for each package as it goes through each package, uh, but it doesn't chain the, the package relationships together. Uh, it also doesn't capture any build artifacts, um, and it was also very, very difficult to set up. Uh, I tried to set up Fossology to work with this. I don't think the version of Fossology that it uses is actually supported anymore. I don't think this plugin is generally supported uh, actively. Um, and it used uh, some homegrown method to generate the SPDX instead of using the uh, supported SPDX tools from the SPDX project. So it, this may seem a little tangential, but uh, I'm going to get there. So there is what I came across uh, in doing this, something called an archiver BB class in Yocto. And the purpose of it seems to be that when you uh, are releasing an image that contains something like GPL and you have uh, requirements to release the source files related to your image, 
then this is a way to package up all the source related to those files in a, and have them in a way that you can then distribute them to, uh, for compliance. So it's not really so much about license compliance, the way it was uh, intended, but it may actually be, be useful towards um, implementing something for license compliance. So it, after the unpack stage, archives all the original code that's there before it does any patching. Then at the patch stage, it has another, a bunch of other uh, steps that it adds to unpack and patch the source code. It has different ways that it can bundle it. It can save everything as the original source and then a set of patches, or it can save just the patch source, uh, or it can save the configured source. You have different options uh, that you can set. And then in the deploy archives, um, when you're building, there's a, a deploy directory and it will put these uh, saved packages. It'll generate, it can generate a source package if you want and save it there as well. Nice thing is it also saves the recipes themselves. So sometimes you are saving the source, you may be saving the additional files that are being added like patches or config files that you would be scanning, but often you're not actually scanning the recipe itself. And the nice thing about this is it will archive not only the recipe, but any include files and anything else that are pulled in in the creation uh, of the package. So again, some of the limitations of uh, Yocto based code scanning today, the SPDX BB class, uh, it only scans the source directory uh, after patching. So the, the one problem with that is you don't get a lot of leverage. If you, for instance, have an upstream source package and you had scans of just the pristine package, uh, and then you had a bunch of different Yocto builds, say, that patched that, that upstream package, or you had a custom build that not only took the patches for that package, but added your own BB appends and then patched that even more, you don't have something to start with that you can then just scan the differences of. Um, what you have in this particular system is something which is already scanning the particular custom patched version of the upstream package. Uh, the archive.bb class is, provides a great way to store original source and then provide that source out to customers uh, for license compliance, um, but it, it's not really intended or integrated in a way that's useful right now for, uh, for code scanning. The fact that it does archive the, um, the build information is very useful because I think that should be part of the scan as well. And the Fossology integration uh, is certainly um, very, very difficult to use. I uh, would say it's not maintained and, and it would have to be actively maintained for this to be a viable way forward. I know some people have, have hooked up uh, the uh, DOSX2 um, instead of Vossology, uh, but that's something that I have not personally tried. So the, the new layer that I added is this uh, source map layer, which the intention of it is that there would be a scan of not just the Yocto package. So let's say something simple like get text. So it wouldn't be a scan of the patched version of get text that Yocto builds. It would be a scan of the tarball for get text that you get from upstream with the package specific information for that. And then a scan of the Yocto get text BB file and all the associated files that it brings with it as its own package with the other as a dependency. And that allows you to have anything that uses get text in the future can leverage all of the scan information from the pristine upstream, upstream package. And then you would only be scanning the delta for the changes that you've made. Uh, initially, when I've done this, the, the do SPDX approach um, was a source based build. The, uh, my initial version of this was also just scanning the source. Um, but in conversations with uh, Kate uh, from the SPDX project, I've learned that the SPDX 1.2 spec, um, there are some additional things that are needed. So the artifacts that are built by the package need to be there. And then the relationships for the particular artifacts, like um, from an executable to a dynamic library, those relationships also need to be captured. So I'm going to have to go through a build phase, uh, which I was hoping to not have to do, uh, but I can't be compliant with the 1.2 spec otherwise. Uh, so the other problem with uh, the do SPDX part was it was doing everything in the context of the Yocto build, which meant it was very hard to parallelize. Uh, it was very hard to do any kind of sort of debugging analysis uh, as it was going on. 
the intention of this was to make it all out of band so that you could go through, do the build, it would generate all the metadata, it would index where all the source files are, it would keep pristine versions of the source files and then the patch versions, and then you could run the scanner on all of that code afterwards, uh, and you could throw it in a parallel build, you could throw EC2 instances at it, you could uh, basically take what could be up to six days and reduce it down to whatever amount of time you wanted. Uh, also parallelizing the hashing and other things as well. Um, the approach is general, so it could be used with any code scanner. Um, so it's not necessarily related to LID, but this was designed to work with LID. So the, the initial approach was um, to insert, a, a, again, a, a step after the unpack stage to take the original source, uh, save the dependency information, unpack the source somewhere so it can be scanned, go through the patch stage, and instead of scanning the patch files themselves for license information, it makes much more sense and it's more accurate to scan the patched file. So the entire file that's already been patched. So the next stage, it will generate a list and index of the actual files that were patched, and it will only scan those as part of the, the package, um, as well as the license or the, uh, the recipe information and others, which I intend to add. There was then also a do uh, source map all target that was generated, so you could just do that and it would traverse all of the different packages related to building a particular package. So for instance, if you had a, uh, a package group that you wanted to build or a final image, then it would go through all of the related dependencies of the image and, uh, and do these additional stages. So the, the way it would work is you do a bit bake of bit bake minus C to say run this stage, uh, which is the source map all for a particular package or package group or image. That would then generate a bunch of metadata for where the source is uh, for all the different packages and the package information. Then there would be, after that's all done, a script that you could run called uh, source map post process, which would then work with the license identifier part. That's what hooks into LID. That will generate license metadata, and then that's all in some intermediate metadata form that you could then run a script that can take that information and generate XPDX out from it. Uh, or it could generate, for instance, uh, a Excel file if that's what a customer wanted to have instead of, for instance, SPDX. The thing I'm going to have to change uh, is now the source map all is going to have to be done after the probably do package QA stage. Because in order to add in the dependency information for a package for something that was built and relationships of dynamic libraries, um, the, at the Yocto layer you have like an R depends variable, which will say this package R depends on this other package, which means at runtime I have to have a library, this is going to provide a runtime library that this package actually needs to run. That's at the package level. SPDX wants to know this particular file in here has a link to a dynamic library satisfied by this other file in another package. And that's the sort of level of granularity I need. Um, the, do QA, the do package QA phase of a Yocto build actually will go through, and at least Morty in later re uh, releases, will go through and see if a dynamic um, dependency of an ELF file is satisfied by other packages in the build. And so I hopefully can hook into that directly to be able to generate those relationships uh, for SPDX. So the, the other problem is that when you go through and you generate all of this information and you generate information, license information for every file, you can, you can get thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of information, which I can go here, here's the stack of, of uh, files that you can go through, which is not necessarily very useful to someone if they don't have a team of lawyers or someone else to weed through all the information. So typically what's digestible is something more at the package level, I find. And so I've, I've looked at this and for my own set, you can't probably read this, but what it has is it would have a target, and in this case it's like get text native, uh, which has, uh, which is the information about the bitbake file in Yocto for get text. It says what the licenses are, which is GPL v3 and LGPL 2.1 um, plus. It says what it provides, which is get text native, and it satisfies a virtual dependency, 
which is actually not captured in Yocto. So if I have packages that provide virtual dependencies, there is no way to specify that in Yocto. So for instance, I could have a uh, uh, kernel headers or a libc or something like that that many different things could satisfy. Um, and you could change them at runtime, but there's no way to, to specify that in Yocto today that I'm aware of. It would then specify what the other dependencies are for other packages. Uh, I summarized what the licenses are of those packages. So from a very, very small view, you can see, okay, well, this package depends on a bunch of other packages, and those are the licenses, and I can kind of eyeball that that actually looks like it's probably okay. It looks like those licenses all work together, and there's no major red flags that tell me that I have incompatible licenses. Um, it also tells me what the licenses of the patched files are, and then it would go through. And then, so I have another entry here called download, and that's the upstream get text package, probably from GitHub, or uh, it actually has, well, there it is there. It's ftp.gnu.org. So it says there's the URI associated with where that package came from, uh, uh, where I have the source file, and then I would have an unpacked uh, repository for the source, and then the hash of that particular thing. Then there would be all of the file level information associated with that upstream tarball. So the package, the top level package would have all of the license information for the dependencies and the patched files. Then the other file would have just the pristine upstream project um, and the files associated with it. So why do I want to make that separation and difference? One is how do we reduce the scan time so that people who are doing this, many, 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 many people who are doing this don't have to all scan the same files over and over. It's very expensive. License scanning can take actually days if you have a very, very accurate scanner. And so when you want to get a product out and you want to make a release, you don't want to then have a six day wait before you can actually get that product out. Uh, so what would make sense is to create a commons of scanned files uh, so that all these things that are being done in Yocto for all these upstream packages don't get scanned by everybody sort of at the leaves of the entire ecosystem. They can all be leveraged from a, a, a commons of, of pre-scanned information. But then what data we need to capture uh, per file or per package? Uh, so some of the things we obviously need are at the file level or the file hash, um, but then we need to know the file type. And some of the things, some people have looked at MIME, but then MIME, you need to know whether it's binary or not. Some people want to know if it's binary, but what is a binary file? Some of the checkers that check things actually say that a UTF-16 file is a binary file, and then you wouldn't actually parse it for the license information. Uh, there's a, a, something that uh, Thomas Gleichsner was using called pigments, which he found was actually fairly accurate for being able to classify files. And then for the license information, when you're scanning a file, say that you find an SPDX identifier, license identifier, but you actually then find license text as well. But what if they don't, um, what if they don't uh, correspond to each other? Or what if there's a license conflict? Then you need to know that. Uh, you want to know what the confidence of the license is based on the information that you scanned. You may want to know the region in the file where you found the license. Uh, and then what is the license name? Is there an SPDX identifier associated with that? So all that metadata should be uh, captured. And then what is the file path of that particular file within the package that you're scanning? And then what is the context of the package name? Because the problem could be you have, say, package A with file A inside it, and then you have package B with the same file A inside it. They have the same hashes but the two packages have different licenses. And there's no license marking inside the file itself. So where you got the file from matters because you can't just collapse everything down to one hash without the context of the package that it came from. Because what you're getting is you're getting the file and the license for that file in the context of the package because the package license is what now applies to the file. So we want to make sure that we're capturing that license information in case there is no license information associated with the file itself. Uh, the other part for package metadata then is we need a hash of the package. So hopefully once all the stuff is worked out for the files themselves and all the uh, discrepancies are worked out, all people are going to care about is what's the hash at the package level? Am I using the same hash? I'm good to go. Uh, the license information also again uh, similar issues. 
Um, but we also need to get license information from the top level license file, the copying file, the notice file, the readme file, anything else that's in there and make sure that there is no conflicting uh, information there. What the package URL is, package name, uh, the version of the package, all the source files associated with it, and then obviously the build artifacts that are there and the relationships between the build artifacts and other packages. Uh, so I will pass it on to Reshmi uh, to talk about the uh, lid scanner and Fossology and all the things related to that. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Um, cool. So we're now in the realm of scanning, right? So let's start with some background uh, and motivation of what led to building lid the way it is right now. Um, so we look at two uh, scanners from the Fossology offering, uh, Nomos and Monk. Um, a little bit of a background for anyone who's not aware. Uh, so Nomos is a regular expression-based snippet matching tool. Uh, so think of regular expressions being uh, license patterns that you would find in source code files, and you'll, you'll get a hit against uh, these patterns. Uh, only snippets are matched, and occasionally, even if uh, exact strings are not matched, Nomos does a pretty good job of saying, hey, something smells like a license here, go figure, um, uh, but I, I can't tell you which one. Um, we found that it's pretty accurate in detecting your common open source license types, uh, about 80% of them. But as far as verbatim SPDX coverage, uh, as, as of our uh, evaluation, which was late December of 2015, uh, it covered only two thirds of the um, SPDX uh, licenses verbatim. Um, we then cre went ahead to create a real world uh, evaluation data set. Uh, this contained uh, Qualcomm proprietary code uh, containing some files that had some op open source license text, um, sometimes with standard SPDX licenses, sometimes with uh, non-SPDX licenses, and Nomos did pretty well in that case. It caught about 94% of the, um, the open source licenses in our uh, real-world evaluation set. Uh, the challenges we found with Nomos is just adding new licenses um, uh, is, is not pre pretty straightforward in that you need to add a new regex rule, recompile the, the underlying C uh, library so that you can rerun it against this new, uh, uh, new regex rule. Um, handling corner cases, of course, this is a regular expression-based tool, so any deviations from your license patterns um, or any uh, unexpected characters, uh, those are not caught. Um, and computationally, regex doesn't appear, uh, is not cheap. So uh, for good reason, uh, the Nomos guys didn't uh, account for all diversions from your uh, standard license patterns um, uh, to keep it computationally um, um, you know, reasonably cheap. Uh, but that means uh, it has a downside of not catching um, certain licenses and deviations. Uh, on to Monk. Uh, Monk is a sequence of words matching tool. Uh, so pretty much it is built to catch full license text. Uh, uh, but if there are any deviations, there is a configuration that you can put in where you can say, hey, skip X amount of words before bailing out on the match and saying, I, I, I don't know what license this is. Um, like I said, it, it does full license matching. But uh, as of our evaluation, it had pretty low coverage, like about 20% of the SPDX licenses were, um, were caught. So if you see this Venn diagram here, uh, out of the total of the 292 SPDX licenses as of our evaluation, uh, Nomos caught about 207, Monk caught 85, and neither caught um, 83 SPDX licenses. All right, so here are the goals with which we built uh, LID, which is a license identifier yes, tool. Uh, we wanted to uh, be able to catch open source licenses. We absolutely wanted to catch everything that the, the standardized SPDX uh, organization publishes as licenses, uh, headers and exceptions included. Uh, and we wanted to catch full license text in source code. Um, we wanted to keep it uh, easy to set up and, and keep updated, because one of the things is to be relevant, you want to be uh, able to bring in the latest licenses as uh, recognized by the organization. Uh, SPDX in this case, and you want to be able to do it easily. Um, we want uh, it to uh, cater to different applications. So some applications may be sensitive in that uh, I'd rather have false positives but give me everything that smells like a license, uh, versus others might say, you know what, I don't care about false positives, give me the real hits. So we wanted it to be tunable to, uh, to tolerance uh, of different applications. Uh, of course, our goal was to aid in uh, uh, license compliance due diligence. Uh, and finally, we wanted to be able to generate SPDX out of whatever we found in, uh, in source code that way. So what does li uh, LID do? Um, it scans source code and generates, um, uh, it, it identifies the matched licenses and uh, the license regions within, um, within source code. Like I said, we use the standardized SPDX templates. We also support uh, headers and exceptions as published on the spdx.org website. Um, and uh, we also allow you to add your custom templates. If your organization had certain deviations and it happens all the time, you could add some custom templates so it, it knows to recognize for those patterns. Uh, underlying, uh, what, uh, what is the 
what's the secret sauce, right? So we use natural language processing's uh, bag of words approach. So what we do is we, uh, we pretty much break up your templates into unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams. And, uh, pretty, and that's our training set of, our, um, uh, of terms to look for, right? So we, we then uh, compute uh, something called a jacquard index, which is, a, 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 which is math for how, how similar these two files are. So I have a source code file, and I have my training set of templates. Um, jacquard index pretty much says, uh, if A and B are my two sets, it's A intersection B divided by A union B. So what's common in A and B divided by what's the entire set of words across A and B? So that gives you a sense of similarity, and that generates what we call a score. Now, of course, in addition to that, we, uh, we use a weighted distribution because we consider bigrams to have more weight than trigrams. So when you have a sentence like a rose is red, rose is red appearing together has more weighted than just rose or is or red. So uh, using this logic, we compute what we call a score. And this is where we can uh, configure a threshold to say, to say, OK, if one is my perfect match, wherein license text in the source code file is exactly the same as the template, then you can say, OK, for my application, I'll, um, I'll set it to like 0 0.06. And we found anything about 0 0.06, it gets pretty accurate. Um, uh, but we have applications that go all the way down to 0 0.04, which uh, uh, again gets you a few false positives, but it, it catches uh, more than less based on the needs of the application. Um, in terms of uh, detecting the license text region, that's part two of the algorithm. Part one is to detect what license it is. Part two is where does it exist in source code. Uh, we use something called edit distance metrics, which is also called a Levenstein um, distance metric. P pretty much what it does is, what does it take to transform this string into this string? Um, so you can, you can read up more on what the, the, how, how Levenstein distance works. But that's how we figure out an optimal start and end position within a, a source code file. So here's an example output of how um, 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 uh, how lid uh, represents hits in a in a file. So green regions are pretty much uh, uh, where it sticks to the template, and red are deviations from the template. Uh, in this case, if you see um, the, the match says it's it's a GPL two dot o based on a one dot o. This is again something that we built custom. This is not your standard template found on SPDX, but it says hey what lines it caught it in, and the original score is is the score that I was talking about, which is the similarity measure, and the region score is the result from your Levenstein distance. All right, uh, time for some comparative analysis. So as I was talking about the, uh, the real-world evaluation data set contain containing mixed uh, code from you know, Qualcomm Proprietary uh, with uh, some standard SPDX licenses, we, we tried to see how these tools compare. Um, the first criteria was uh, coverage. So if you just looked at how many SPDX licenses does each of these tools detect, uh, of course, LID is built on the SPDX uh, li li license template, so it catches 100% um, of the licenses uh, there. Um, at the time of the evaluation, uh, Nomos caught 70% and Monk caught about 29%. All right, let's go down to accuracy in terms of, hey, did it identify the right, right license and uh, the, the region within source code? Uh, we found in this case, uh, like I said, that for our real world evaluation data set, LID does about the same or um, a little better than, than NOMOS. Uh, in, in this case, 94% accuracy is what we found. Uh, I have additional data about this in our backup slides if you guys uh, are interested uh, to, to, to look more into what, uh, what the exact numbers were. Um, Again, our data primarily contained your popular SPDX licenses. Um, and uh, in terms of the license text region, uh, LID is built to catch the entire license text. I have some examples in the next few slides. Uh, NOMOS, again, built to find snippets. So if you're considering uh, using something like NOMOS, you might not be able to generate everything you need for your SPDX file like that. Um, Monk, of course, is built to find full license text. But like I said, the, the coverage was pretty low when we evaluated it. All right, so the last criteria that we used was flexibility. Mark talked a little bit about uh, the difficulties he had while, uh, while using Fossology uh, uh, as an integration uh, using Yocto for drone code. Um, anything you want to add, Mark, on uh, LID in terms of setup? Um, uh, yeah, super. So I have a Docker image that's published that basically can set up the, all the dependencies for setting up LID uh, mm -hmm. and running LID. And then as far as integrating it, it was really simple just to call the Python wrapper around it to, to create it. And you get direct feedback because you get all the data back. With the Fossology part, it was like I was running it, and I actually couldn't tell if I was connecting with the database or not. OK. 
Cool. Yeah, so I mean, uh, a lot of um, um, the motivations, again, for LID were based on feedback from Mark and, and some of the challenges he was having through uh, through the Fossology integration. So we did have the benefit of standing on the shoulders of um, you know the Fossology integration that way. Um, in terms of adding new licenses, like I said, we do uh, we do have a feature to automatically update licenses from your SPDX license list. Um, just add the templates that you need, add custom templates if you uh, if you may so choose to, and you're off to the races. Uh, again, with Nomos, a little bit difficult. You have to add a new regex rule, recompile. So you need to really understand how the nitty gritty of Nomos works to uh, be able to add new license files. Uh, in the area of parameter tuning, I said that was one of our goals again. Um, you can set thresholds uh, for similarity scores depending upon the tolerance of your application. Um, Nomos does not offer any kind of parameter tuning beyond altering your uh, regex patterns as um, as you need to. And uh, Monk does allow you to configure how many words to skip before bailing out of the match, but not really that intuitive. Finally, uh, scores, if that is something that is of interest to you, it, our tool does uh, return what is, uh, how similar these are, what confidence level we feel in this. So you can, of course, convert that into, uh, we're actually working to convert that into a rating scale so that your non-technical users can say, hey, on a scale of one to five, how, how much am I feeling this hit? Um, yeah? Yeah, so I'll repeat the question uh, for, the, for the purpose of the recording. Um, so the question was, is there a way to set confidence levels on a per license family? Because MIT has a lot more flavors than your, uh, your, your GPL family of licenses. Not at this time. Right now, it, you set it on a, on, a, on a per run basis. So you can almost say, hey, for this run, for, my for this project that I'm running this for, here's the confidence level. But that's interesting. I'm, I, I want to explore that. Because we found cases where the BSD 2 and 3, it'll trip it up a little bit. Because because they're so similar. So um, I, I just had a bug right before I, I came to this conference that I have to start looking at. So maybe setting a confidence based on a family of licenses might be the way to go um, for, for cases like that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, all right. Um, a quick example, so we took an example package uh, and we used DOSOX v2 to generate SPDX uh, using uh, its underlying uh, default agent, which is Nomos at this point. Uh, it found five uh, licenses as mentioned there, and um, uh, really that, that's the uh, example SPDX output that DOSOX uh, 2 um, uh, spits out. Uh, one thing that you see, because it uses Nomos, is it does not spit out your entire license text. That's the nature uh, of, of the Nomos um, uh, logic there. But if you see the, si uh, the similar package uh, the, the same package using lid, it uh, spits out that output. The license text, of course, is complete. Uh, you can you can choose to use that directly and to, to, to a product distribution that way. It did also catch uh, additional licenses on top of what um, uh, no, uh, Nomos did uh, in the same uh, DOSOX v2 integration. All right, so um, right. we are at the point where we want to start talking about what the status is and what future work we see in this space. Uh, I'll just start with saying, hey, this is available as a project on our Codedora forum um, uh, site uh, through, through Qualcomm, uh, but we are working to make it available through GitHub so that we can get a lot more collaboration going. That's coming uh, uh, like in a few weeks from here. Uh, but if you want to check it out, that's where it is. It's distributed under the uh, BSD3 new clause. So yeah, please try it out and give us feedback, um, and I'll let Mark yeah. uh, talk and about And there is, in fact, a fork of it right now on, on GitHub. So if there was somebody who wanted to make a contribution or make a comment or file an issue, they could mm -hmm. certainly do it there as well. Because um, one of the maintainers is the one who made the fork. So the initial source map layer stuff that I've been working on is uh, on my GitHub account. Uh, so github.com slash Uh There's also Docker files there that will set up the entire environment for running lid. Uh, and we'll pull lid from CAF, so you can set up a simple environment to, to run it, and it shows all the dependencies required. So the next things to do are the source map and lid integration. I didn't go too far down that road because I was just still getting input from Kate and others. Uh, we just presented this at the Open Source Leadership Summit last week, um, and so we got some good feedback there as well. I'm looking at re-architecting it, and I've already started to put it on top of the Archiver BB class uh, so that I can take the, the stored code. Um, right now, I'm creating a copy of the Archiver BB class. The problem was, and I don't know how many Yocto people are here, I can't actually figure out what the license is of the Archiver BB class because the license information for Yocto 
is very, very unclear. It says that the files, it gives a license about what metadata license has, and it says other things. So it says things that are metadata have an MIT license, and other things have a GPL license, but it doesn't clarify what metadata is. I think that they mean that the BB files are metadata and BB classes are metadata, but it's very unclear. Yes? Yeah. But the license needs to be clarified for people to actually stand on that. Because the way that it's written, you'd have to interpret what metadata means. Yeah. So, um, OK. Well, Python code in a recipe is not in most people's language definition of made it metadata. Where is that clarified? You want to repeat that? Okay. Okay. Great. Um, build artifacts uh, need to be added, so I'm trying to figure out how to hook that into the QA phase of the of the packaging QA. Do you have a question? Be here. Okay. Um, uh, the, yeah, then the creating optimal code setting, being able to parallelize as much of this as possible. Um, LID does the parallelization, but yep. not uh, distributed computing. It will do it on a machine, so yep. it uses the Python framework to actually um, create parallel uh, yep. analysis when you give it a directory or you give it a set of files. It will or it use parallel threads, yep. um, but it, we need to do a way to spawn multiple LID instances across yep. multiple machines to be able to crunch this in a much faster way. And then using the, the license information that's already there in Yocto, but it's not really part of any of the license scanner right now. So Yocto will generate you license information and it will put it in the deploy directories and you can have it all there, but it's not integrated in any way into um, the license scanner output currently. Uh, yeah, Behan, go ahead. Lib magic, no. Uh, so the question was about identifying files and MIME types and that kind of thing. I had listed some things. Uh, Behan had suggested looking at lib magic. Yeah, uh, I, I, we use that for some of our uh, MIME type determination for uh, the other scanning we do with CodeScan. So uh, I like lib magic quite a bit. It also lets you read the source, uh, source code and uh, almost the full file if you want to determine the MIME type uh, beyond just extensions and things like that. That's great to hear, yeah, um, yep. So I'm just gonna repeat what, what uh, he said so uh, people uh, listening into the video can um, uh, get the response. So libmagic also uses magic numbers in addition to just MIME types. Um, I, I love libmagic too. I mean, um, we use it to determine uh, binary files and uh, uh, source code uh, for some of the scanning uh, that we do and uh, I love it. Um, so yeah, please try out libmag libmagic if you wanna yeah. find out. Yeah, yeah, Python. We use the Python binding for that. Yep. So, so one of the open challenges, I'll come back to you. I just want to make one quick point. The, one of the open challenges is about binary files and scanning and, and yep. what to actually do with them. So if you identify a file as a binary that's yep. an executable, do you scan anything? Do you scan the strings? Do you ignore the file? Do you say, this is a binary file, I'm not scanning it? Uh, so that, and then when you have file identification, you say, great, this is a file of type X, but what do I do with file type X? Do mm -hmm. I ignore it? Do I scan it? Do I scan the strings? Yeah. There's no policies around that right now. Sure, but at least, at least if you can identify as like an elf file, at least now you know how to scan it. Yeah. Correct, right. Yeah, no, definitely helpful. Appreciate the input. You had another question. I do. The second part is, is you were talking about caching so that you don't have to do the thing again. Yes.
Correct. So, so Behan's comment was that there's a shared state facility inside of Yocto today that allows the teams to collaborate. And when some team member has done uh, a build or a scan or something, if that's captured in shared state, then it doesn't have to be redone by other team members. Uh, correct. And then there's ways to use the shared state. And I think the DUS PDX and the archiver class both use shared state. Uh, yeah. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't scale beyond the team. And the problem is there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies using Yocto that are all doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. So I'm working on a solution for that. Okay. <laughs> but if it's shared state, it might just be solved. All right. <laughs> oh, incredible. Yeah, so that's, that's really our next thing on our um, status and future work deal. Uh, yeah, so really figuring out how to get these comments to be leveraged beyond uh, a team or um, a company that way. Um, and then how do we handle um, um, and share manual review of, uh, or yeah. changes to you know, your uh, automated license data? Um, and you have 100, 100 MBs worth of uh, uh, SPDX data. Uh, do we have a tool? Uh, could we build a tool to review this data? Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, so my thoughts on this initially had been a design which would have been outside of the build process and so it wouldn't have been dependent on finishing the scans in order to finish the build. We could do it in a way that, uh, or certainly create something that's more like what exists today that would be the scan would have to be completed in the context of a build. It just means your build might take six days to complete if you're okay with that. Uh, and then you could certainly put the SPDX information into the build part. You just have it be an artifact and have the packager include that uh, into the, I mean, you don't necessarily even have to put it in the RPM or DEB or, or whatever. You could put it as another file in there that's in the deploy directory that would go with the DEB. But if you wanted to put it in the DEB itself, you'd almost have to do two phases because you're going to have mm -hmm. to put it back into the uh, the image directory that's being used to create the deb file. So you can do what's done now, which is the top level, package level, mm. source level information, and you can create the SPDX information, but you cannot get all of the build artifact information uh, and license analysis of that, I don't think, at the time of build, unless you're doing it like in a two-phase yeah. approach. That, that sounds like Yeah. <laughs> yep. Kate, are you? Yeah, because the, the SP, oh, re repeat it, sorry, do you want Yeah. Kate was saying that there should be a way to take the SPDX information that's generated and then be able to put it back into the package. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so Kate was mentioning that yes, the SPDX file should be able to be incorporated at the package level when it's been generated, and that is interesting future work that we should try to collaborate on. Okay, finally, uh, with, with LID, um, things that we think we can uh, improve on. Um, right now, um, handling multiple licenses, we can do it, uh, but with large files, the performance gets pretty abysmal, uh, because what happens is that, so let's say you have a file that has uh, an Apache and MIT license, just for the sake of discussion, uh, and so the way it will work is the first step, which is the 
detect which license part, it will match both our Apache and MIT templates. And then step two is to identify the region. During, uh, during the region identification, the way it works right now is, let's say Apache is on the top, MIT is, a, a, is at the bottom. It will do the MIT uh, Apache region and it will almost pretend like that never existed in the file and restart the first step. And then this time it will only get like the MIT hit. And you know, so it's really, uh, we should be playing in the n-gram space uh, instead of restarting this process this way. So uh, that's certainly an improvement that we uh, uh, we have on our roadmap um, to uh, to work on, and then in terms of accuracy, it really is not that great at detecting short licenses. Um, so that's that's another thing that I mean I'm I'm interested in hearing if people have ideas there. Uh, binary files, like Mark said, that's a challenge, ongoing challenge to determine what do we do with these with these binary files? Do we just extract strings for matching? Let's talk about it. Um, Finally, integration into other tools. So can DOSOX V2 offer this as an agent for generating SPDX? Um, that's something that we certainly want to uh, explore. Um, so one other quick uh, item. Lid's limitation is we don't uh, scan SPX identifiers today. Yes. Uh, from our talk with Kate yesterday, uh, one of the immediate actions that I have is to add the SPDX identifiers into Lid so that it can detect uh, your one-line SPDX identifier that means this BOR. So you know, you're not really going off and trying to understand what BOR is. Everyone's defined what that is. So yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, an immediate action for us. All right, that's that's pretty much our time, and be, I think we do have qu time for questions. If you yep. uh, if you guys have any, yep. all, all right. right. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody for coming. Yeah.